pastor. Special welcome to those who are joining us on the live stream. If you are joining us in that way, uh, please feel free to connect with one another in the chat. And if you have a prayer, joy, or concern you'd like lifted up later on in the service, you can put that in the chat as well, and I will do my best to raise those up on your behalf. I also want to let everybody know that if it is your first time here or one of your one of your first times here and you have not yet done so, there are blue cards in the front of each pew which you are invited to fill out. Uh, if you do fill one of those out, we will be able to add you to our electronic and uh, regular mailing list to share with you about all the things happening in the life of our church. And I always assure people that if you fill out one of those cards, there will be no unannounced pastoral visits. We will just share with you by mail and email. Email so we can let you know all the exciting stuff going on. I want to let you know that um, we will not have Sunday school today for elementary age children because our teacher is unfortunately out sick today, um, but children five and under are welcome to go to the nursery if, and playground out there. Uh, our nursery staff is ready for them. I also want to just mention that the Adelphi's group's next meeting is July 13th, and then invite everybody for a time of fellowship after the service where we can connect over coffee and a treat and uh, keep uh, worship going outside of the four walls or however many walls we have in this church. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite you to please stand as you are able as we center ourselves with the call to worship. Friends, today is a gift from God. In all the land, new life is happening. Feel the wonder and power of God's creative energy. Feel the awe and joy of God's love for us. Let us worship God with a full sense of joy and expectation. So in souls to God's lavish love. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing our first song. It's number 57 in the hymnal. We're singing verses 1, 3, and 7, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. If you open up your bulletin to the first page, you'll find our opening prayer. And these words are in bold, which invites us to pray them together. We come into your presence, O Lord, with so much on our hearts. Help us to be open to your words of healing and restoration. Bring us closer to you. Enable us to discern your will for us so that we may serve you more faithfully by serving others in need. In Christ's name we pray, amen. At this time, I'd like to invite our children and those young at heart to come forward for our children's moment as we sing This Is Where Children Belong. and thank you for bringing forward that food, a reminder to the congregation. Each Sunday we collect food for the Marin County Food Bank, so if you have something that you'd like to donate, you can bring it to church, put it in the center aisle, and our young folks will 
bring it forward. So I have something here. It's one of those special toys that has spanned multiple generations. You may have even seen this toy featured in the movie Toy Story. I believe there's one of these in there. This is called a Magic 8-Ball. And Magic 8-Balls, like I said, have been around for a long time, but they've always done the same thing. The idea behind it is you have a question. Like, let's, let's just think of a random question. How about this? Uh, is Pastor Luke the coolest pastor there ever is? And then I shake this, and then an answer comes, and what does that say? It says, it is certain. <laughs> it is certain. It really says that I have witnesses up here. So, so some might say, oh, the Magic 8-Ball said it. It must be true. But as we know, it's kind of just chance, right? It's just a fun, silly game, and whatever pops up will pop up, and we probably should not make choices or decisions or evaluations based on what the magic eight ball says. So in thinking about decisions, though, and thinking about how this is fun, but probably not the best way to make decisions, I wanted to share with you just briefly a little bit about how decisions are made as a church. For our church, we believe in something called Christian conferencing. So I'm going to invite everybody to say that with me on three. We're going to say Christian conferencing on one, two, three. One, two, three. Christian conferencing. And what we believe as Methodists is that we are better together, that when we gather together and we pray together and we talk together and we think together and share all of our wisdom and experience regardless of age, some people might be much older, some people might be younger, and we all share the wisdom and insight God gives us, and together, through conferencing, through coming together and talking, that's how we make decisions as a church. And it's very important to know that because every single person in this sanctuary is part of that process, either directly by, we have some people who go to a big conference we have every year where some of those decisions are made, or everybody else who, who helps select and lift up and vote upon who we send to be in that Christian conferencing, as well as the decisions we make here right at Mount Tam Church, not the bigger church. So what I want to remind you today is that your voice matters. Your experience matters. Your wisdom matters. And through all of us together, and God with us, we will find the best way forward today and for the future. So I'm going to pray. I invite everybody who would like to to please repeat after me. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for the wisdom you have given us. Thank you for the friends you have given us. Thank you for the gift of Christian conferencing. Help us to remember that wisdom can be found in many places and that you can work through many different people. Amen. Thank you very much. Caleb, I'm going to give you that to take. And then we have some special music, so I'm going to invite you just to scoot back for a little bit so we can have front row to this special music. Thank you, Chloe, for singing for us today. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. 
This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me, and I, I'm desperate for you. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me, and I, I'm desperate for you, and I. This is the air I breathe. This is the As I mentioned in the children's moment, we're thinking about Christian conferencing because last week was our annual conference, and you'll be hearing about our lay members uh, from our lay members who went to annual conference. And in preparation for their sharing, we uh, will be, I will be, lifting up the scripture passage that was used as the theme for our conference this year. But before we get to the scripture, I invite you to join me in the prayer before reading. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scripture is read and your word proclaimed, we may hear what you say to us today. Amen. Hear this reading from the prophet Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 19. The Lord says, Who makes a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters? Who brings out chariot and horse, army and battalion? They will lie down together and will not rise. They will be extinguished, extinguished like a wick. Don't remember the prior things. Don't ponder ancient history. Look, I'm doing a new thing. Now it sprouts up. Don't you recognize it? This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Wesley, you're not the delegate to annual conference. Louise, come on up.
Is this about right? Yeah. Good morning. Starting in 1975, when Gil Vieira was pastor here, I represented this church for multiple years at the California Nevada Annual Conference. This morning, I will contrast what conference was like for me back then compared to my experience last week. It's not my intention to make any value judgment about which is better, but simply to report on my observations. 48 years ago, there were mostly white male clergy with few people of color and few women serving the 385 churches, <clears throat> churches in the Northern California and Northern Nevada Conference. Today, this is much more, there is much more cultural diversity with growth especially in the Korean and Tongan churches. In this conference, about 37% of our clergy are immigrant pastors and 63% are non-immigrant pastors. In the past, a thousand members plus hundreds of visitors gathered at the Sacramento Conference Center where we met again this year. Clergy and laity sat together at assigned tables, enabling interaction with each other over the four days. It was an opportunity to get acquainted and share ideas. My table gave me a place of belonging where I could leave my printed materials, rest my elbows on the table, and easily take notes. It was comforting to know where my place was in the crowd. This year, in that huge room with a similar number of people, there were no tables. No tables available for my materials and my elbows. Just many long rows of chairs. Sit where you wish. At the opening session of conference in 1975, I remember being thrilled by the sound of so many male voices singing the hymn, And Are We Yet Alive? A tradition that was observed for many years. I missed singing it this year. Bishop Marvin Stewart presided over conference sessions in the 1970s. He was a distinguished looking gray haired man with very definite ideas about how to conduct the proceedings. The atmosphere was more formal and business dress was typical. Acting Bishop Sally Dick presided over this year's session. She is flexible, funny, and effective. She created a relaxed, spontaneous, and joyful atmosphere, including clapping and cheering. Technology played a big role in how reports were presented with two large projection screens on each side of the podium, enabling us to more readily see who was speaking. During the 1970s, there were maybe eight or 10 clergy women serving churches in this conference. They were beginning to claim their leadership power as almost everything was dominated by white males. I have it on good authority that back then, the women clergy met in the women's bathroom to strategize about how to elect women to, to the general conference delegation. Women have become much more visible over the years. Today, they make up about 40% of the ordained clergy in this conference. The use of more inclusive language in liturgy and music was advocated back in 1976 when the conference songbook was introduced. It was a red loose leaf notebook with about 100 songs in it with revised words. At this time, Gil Vieira was inspired to adapt the words to hymn number 94 using inclusive language. We sing the doxology here most Sundays. In fact, I think we're singing it today. Next time you open up the hymnal, 
Notice Gill is credited with composing the words. He told me recently that he was paid $35 for copyright permission to use his words when the, when the uh, hymnal was published. Our conference has had a strong commitment to social justice and equality and has been a leader in urging the greater church to elect women bishops and bishops of color. I have a great appreciation for being connected with other United Methodists where, where we can accomplish more together than we can alone and where we reach out to other cultures and stand for LGBTQ rights. I'm happy to report that even with the closure of four small churches and six churches that chose to disaffiliate from our conference, 324 churches are still connected and we're supporting each other as we reach out in continuity together. Yes, in response to hymn number 553, we are yet alive. The United Methodist Church is still standing. It's just different. Now, I've only known Luke for about a year. My early impression of him is that age, at age 35, he's probably above average in practicing his chosen profession. But when I heard that the median age of clergy in our conference is 58, I realized he's way down on the lower end of that scale. Our conference will be hurting to find new pastors to serve our churches as clergy retire. Here at Mount Tam, we are fortunate to have a younger pastor assigned to us. Remember, in the United Methodist Church, it's only one year at a time. Happily, Luke has been reappointed by the bishop to serve us for another year. Thanks, Louise, my partner in crime. This past week, I attended my 21st annual conference session. I'll just briefly remind you of how I got into this racket. And that was back when Pastor Dave was around and he just came up to me one Sunday and he put his, he did the LBJ thing. He put his hand on my shoulder and he said, how'd you like to be the lay member to the annual conference? And I said, What's that? But if you want me to do it, I'll do it. So 21 years later, I'm still, I'm still at it. Just a quick reminder, annual conference is a geographical designation for a region of congregations. A region. In our case, that's Northern California and Northern Nevada. Annual conference session, or ACS, is a meeting. It is our annual June conference. A couple of observations right off the top. First one, the annual sessions are all alike over the years. The second observation, the annual sessions are all unique. No two are alike. Secondly, it matters who you bring to the annual dance. And I was really lucky this year. Your partners in this annual dance make a big difference. There's the pastor. Enough said about that. And then there's the other lay member to annual conference session. This year it was Louise Carter, whom I've known for decades, but I haven't known her very well. Now I know her a lot better, and that's a blessing. She herself is, as she just told you, a conference and a, a UMC veteran. 
And in my opinion, she is, she was, and she is an annual conference natural. What was also very precious for me during the conference is that she shared memories of my, my mom. Much of their time in the congregation overlapped. They had a lot of, they did a lot of activities together and although they were, I think, about 30 years apart in age, they really clicked. And what was very special was that Louise was gracious enough to tell me a number of stories about my mother and uh, stories that I'd never heard and things about how my mom was proud of me. My mother didn't say that very often, but when I heard Louise say, your mother was proud of you when you went to Berkeley, for example. That really touched my heart. Thank you, Louise. Our two unofficial partners at the dance, first of all, George Carter, I'll just say he knows a thing or two about annual conference, and Dan Sillen, who has been to about as many annual conferences as I have unofficially. But I want to say again, my dear, that without you, I may never have returned to the Methodist fold 23, 20, excuse me, 27 years ago. You're the one who got me back here, and you come with me every Sunday. I love you. Witnessing a new thing was the ACS theme. And of course, much was new. New lay members, new pastors being appointed, an interim bishop, but then there was the past and the present to contend with, not just the future. Our conference bishop is on leave pending a possible public trial. And per UMC rules, we know nothing, we the laity and the clergy, we know nothing about why this has happened, what the charges against her are. You've heard about this before. We have an interim bishop who is, <clears throat> has done the best that she can under the circumstances. The one thing, and I have to smile, this is sort of endearing. The one, the one thing that she seems to be having trouble with is when the, the appointments for the new pastors and the reappointment of, older, of the, of the uh, older pastors comes along, it's done geographically by our districts. And she gets to read the place names of the churches, and she's, I really should have tried to help her, you know, being a, ge being a geography professor, and uh, she's still having a little trouble with some of the California place names, but she's much better this year, and she does have a, I'll, I'll give you this, that woman has a sense of humor, and bishops don't always have, forgive me, bishops are not, don't always have a sense of humor. But still, this situation, kind of half in, half out, bishop-wise, is troubling and unsettling, and it's still unsettled, even after a year and a half. I want, to I want to mention again, as I did last year, the youth most active at the annual conference. And the youth most active at our annual conference are those from the Pacific Islanders congregations. They are wonderful. They are vibrant. They want to come to conference. And this year we were treated to music from a, a, a group of Pacific Islander youth. They're called Cafe Agape. And you have heard that word in here before. Kim often used the word agape to remind us of what, of the love that Christ modeled for us. Agape love, not romantic love, agape love. These kids were great. And I want to say again, and especially since we have a theme of a new thing, what would it be like if some year real soon we sent a youth delegation from this church, maybe not a musical group, but a group to witness what goes on? I wish we could do that. That would be a new thing. We were blessed to have an outside speaker share with us in several plenary sessions. Her name was Rebecca Simon Peter. Now, when she introduced herself, and I was sitting next to Louise, I leaned over, and I, leaned over and I whispered to Louise, 
wow, that is such a great Christian surname. Turns out, though, that this charismatic retired UMC pastor had a more complicated story, a very complicated story. She told us that she was raised as an observant Jew. Her mom was Jewish, but here's the wrinkle. Her dad was an Italian Catholic. She says to us, beaming, I'm a hybrid. She regaled us with stories of her family's many domestic theological quarrels and disputes. Well, that really rang true for me. My father was Jewish, as some of you know, and my mother was a Kansas farm girl Methodist. I don't think they quite knew what they were getting into when they got married. There was long tension, a long, long period of tension in our family over that religious split. When I later ran into Rebecca at the Hyatt, I told her that I, too, had had one Jewish parent and one Christian parent. And then I said to her, I'm a hybrid, too. And, of course, so is my husband. We know about hybrid. Out of Rebecca's upbringing came her eventually choosing a Christian path, which is also an amazing story, and becoming an ordained United Methodist Church pastor. That's really going all out, right? What she shared with us, and really this was a running theme at conference, was how to deal with conflict. Conflict was, I, I know a new thing, was the theme. But conflict was close behind it. She shared with us how to deal with conflict. Conflict in all types of relationships, in marriages, friendships, but especially in religious conflicts. And we are a denomination in conflict now. The UMC is a smack dab in the middle of a big con conflict, and I capitalize those two words, big conflict. The pending schism, it's ongoing right now, of the division, of the, de of the denomination rather, primarily over the matter of reconciliation with LGBTQA plus con the community. Even as I speak, about 20% Think about that. 20% of the U.S. Methodist congregations are choosing to, and this is the word of the hour, disaffiliate from the denomination, and they are going on to form what they call the Global Methodist Church, not the United Methodist Church, the Global Methodist Church. Now, this disaffiliation rate is only about 2% in California but it's 20% in the U.S. as the whole. And most of that disaffiliation is, and I bet you can guess where it is. It's in the South, and it's in the Southern Great Plains. So it's, it's a big thing there. Talk about conflict. Here's a full-blown theological schism, a religious divorce, as it were. But what Reverend Simon Peter did was Number one, calm us down. What can we do as individuals in the face of this rupture in our denomination? How should we react to our departing siblings in Christ? And secondly, she offered us context. And I think this was, for me at least, this was quite astounding and, and, and comforting in a way. She had a slide up there that showed all the schisms and the splits and the separations and the re, reunite, reunifications within our denomination since the mid-18th century. Guess what? This is not a new rodeo. We've been doing this for hundreds of years. And although you could say, well, that's not a very, that doesn't sound like good news. I think it's good news because it gives us context. It shows us that this current, this current split is not a new thing, is not a new thing. Uh, as she presented us with this history of, of all these major separations we, that we have survived in the past 200 years, 
she urged us to note the word we the words we survived we survived every one of them and often it was for the best often it was for the better as catastrophic as this current rupture right now in the denomination may seem it has happened before and it has happened frequently and we lived through it and we thrived in fact and this really got my attention the longest stable period in Methodist history was from, and this is going back to the, to the mid 18th century, the longest, I guess, semi-tension free period in our denomination without any splits or mergers was the 55 years between 1968 when the Methodist Church merged with the Evangelical United Brethren Church to become the United Methodist Church. So between 1968 and 2022, that was 55 years. This is a new thing, but it's not a new thing. We live through it and we'll live through this. In the end, I believe Rebecca Simon Peters' message of accepting and living with conflict comes down to the title of her book, Dream Like Jesus. To dream again, to recapture the vision of making the kingdom of God a reality, she writes, to quit making excuses, and to once again tap into the transforming power of Jesus. Now, when I heard this, I was reminded of a powerful call from one of my favorite theologians, Dallas Willard. He summed up our aspirational life as Christians this way, Quote, never, ever forget that we are called to be disciples of Christ. Every day, what would Jesus do? How would he come to deal with conflict? Who is our role model? How would Christ live our lives? How would Christ live my life? How would Jesus live my life? How would he live your life? In President Jimmy Carter's book of meditations entitled Sources of Strength, he urges Christians not only to profess their faith. We've all done that, haven't we? I know I have. But to act on it every day. And I want to quote from that book of meditations that I've been reading for the last several weeks. Jimmy Carter writes, the fact is that we have available what the disciples possessed, knowledge of the resurrection and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm disturbed, he went on, by a sermon preached in our little Baptist church 40 years ago. I don't remember anything about that sermon except the title. And the title was, If You Were Arrested for Being a Christian, Would There Be Enough Evidence to Convict You? Amen. Louise. Before we respond in song with And Are We Yet Alive, as Louise lifted up the history of that song in our conference, first I want to defend Bishop Sally's pronunciations as a fellow. She got her start in the East Ohio Conference. I got my start in the East Ohio Conference. And it is a little confusing, some of the names. When my family visits from Ohio, they still call it San Rafael instead of San Rafael. So no, it's a systemic issue, <laughs> not a personal issue. Um, also, I just want to say that when I was first transferring from the East Ohio Conference to the California Nevada Conference, there was two things, two major differences. First, the California Nevada Conference was known as a pioneer, that, that they stretched out in inclusivity and prophetic witness more than any other conference in the whole worldwide United Methodist Church. Also, 
I was going from a conference East Ohio, so half of the state of Ohio, not much land mass, and that little piece of uh, land, there were 900 United Methodist congregations versus the 300 and something here in our huge geographic area. And so the phrase that quickly came into being was California, was, California Nevada was small but mighty. Small but mighty. And one thing that is shifting in this time of change and disaffiliation and restructuring is that, as you heard, whereas the average in the United States is 20% of churches disaffiliating, and in the East Ohio Conference it was 33%, one-third of the churches disaffiliated. Here, it was less than 2%, and by membership, even less than that. And I don't lift this up to say, you know, we have it better than other people. I lift it up to say, we have a very, um, we have a very big opportunity here with less disruption than other places to stand in that tradition of prophetic witness, of radical inclusion, and to do so no longer from a status of small but mighty, and now we're just mighty. Now we have the opportunity just to be, be mighty as the, the playing field of how, of talking about this kind of democratic process that we have of discernment and, and listening to God's leading, we have a voice unlike never before as the California Nevada Conference. And so one of the things I ask you to pray for is that we might harness this opportunity to share God's radically big love with the world and to make our voice just as strong as those voices that have been pushing people out and telling people they're not good enough. We have a new day. We have a huge opportunity. And as, as we also heard, we have a lot of young people who are coming. Our, our churches, our, especially our Pacific Islander and Asian churches, they are growing. They are flourishing. We are getting stronger as a conference. And we have resources, whether it's property or otherwise, we have resources unlike any other conference. All of this is a recipe for something big and bold and indeed new in the future. And each of us in this room get to be a part of it. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's clap for it. And let us continue to celebrate the future that is in front of us as we join together in hymn number 553, And Are We Yet Alive? And typically we sit for the second hymn, but I think today, please stand as you are able for this hymn.
us make our boast of his redeeming power, which saves us to the uttermost, till we can sin no more. Let us take up the cross, till we the crown obtain, and gladly reckon all things lost, so we may Jesus gain. Together, we not only share our presence, we not only share our witness and our prayers, we share our gifts for the work of ministry in the world. And as we prepare to share our offering, I invite you to remember these words from Jesus. Where you place your treasure, so too will be your heart. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. We give thanks for all of the gifts in our life. In response to all that we have been entrusted with, we offer back this portion for the work of your church praying boldly that these gifts may be used according to your holy and perfect will as we strive to be a church that is brave enough to do a new thing. Amen. You may be seated. One of the ancient practices of the Christian church when we gather together for worship is to lift up our prayers, share our prayers aloud to one another knowing that when one of us is celebrating, we all find joy in that. And when one of us is carrying a heavy burden, we're all called to support that person or that need, that need during this time. I, uh, first, I'm just turning online to see uh, if we have any prayer requests. Um, doesn't look like online, so I want to just share the ones that were given to me beforehand before I open it up. First, let us uh, pray for our Sunday school teacher that was scheduled for today, uh, Reed Lessinger, who is home recovering from illness. Let us pray that um, the illness passes quickly 
and that he is fully back as quickly as possible and also lift up a prayer of gratitude for him and all of those who volunteer as our Sunday school teachers. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Prayers for my wife, Stephanie, who will be uh, traveling home today after a weekend getaway with her sisters celebrating her oldest sister's 40th birthday. And they had a wonderful time and, and just prayers for safe travel on their way home. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. I want to lift up another concern. This one is for um, a regular attender and member of our church, many of whom you know well, Judy White. Uh, we got a call over the weekend from her daughter that Judy White um, needed to be checked into um, the South Marin Health and Wellness Center for some physical rehab. And she is um, really hoping for some visitors and calls and connections during this time. Again, she's at the South Marin Health and Wellness Center in Greenbrae. And if you can uh, stop by and say hello or, or call there um, and just give her your well wishes, it would mean so much to her. And we pray for Judy during this time. We pray for her full um, restoration through the rehab, and we pray for all of the, the physical therapists and other health professionals who are helping her on her road to recovery. God, may your spirit be at work in all of that. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. And I tr really try, I really, really try not to make it a practice of calling out people here in the sanctuary, but I just have to. I'm sorry, forgive me. The Reverend Kit Evans Ford is here, and I have not seen Kit since I, I probably seminary or right after seminary. We went to Pacific School of Religion together, and she is, from what I see on Facebook and other sources, she is a shining star in the church, and we are blessed to have her with us, and I hope that if you get a chance, you can say hello to her after church, and welcome, Kit. We are so glad to have you with us and to be connected as one body in Christ. Let us lift this prayer of joy to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. What other joys or concerns do you bring with you? Tricia. All right. We give thanks to God for the wonderful week-long experience at Sierra Service Project with uh, Tricia and Melissa leading some of our youth there. We give thanks for the summer staff who are there all summer long, having groups and churches visit as they work in the community and share God's love with the community. We lift this joy to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Enough. Yeah. Um, I am feeling so much better, so much more like myself, so mm. I'm really grateful um, mm. to be like, moving towards almost 100%. Yes. Full recovery. A prayer of gratitude for healing and recovery after surgery and the amazing gift that our body is from God, that it can heal itself. Sometimes it takes a little longer than we hope. Sometimes it happens faster. And we also give thanks for all who have journeyed along Trisha during this time of recovery. And we give thanks that she is on the road to 100%. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Prayers for Madeline and Michelle, her mother, who has recently been diagnosed with cancer. We pray that they might find comfort in one another's presence and that they might feel God's comforting presence dwelling among them. We pray for all of the treatment options to come, that the best one can be found, and that um, 
that Michelle might just have the, the strength and courage to face this and, and conquer it. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Gail? All right. Two of my brothers, Frank and Tom, are going through rough patches, and my son, Chris, one, one of his beloved dogs, has a life-threatening chronic illness. Mm, so for your brothers, Frank and Tom, did I get those names correct, who are in need of prayers and strength and discernment during this time, and for your son's dog, a member of the family, what is the pup's name? Kimmick. Kimmick? Ah, Alaskan Husky, and we all know that our pets are members of our family, that we love them so dearly, and we just pray that, that in that situation, um, all that can be done can take place, and that we can all, in this time, take a moment to remember the gift of God's creation, the animals that dwell among us, that are part of our companionship. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes. That is today. The South Korean National Anthem for the commemoration of the Korean the Korean War. My brother and her father are with her. I don't know what time it's going to be, so gratitude lifts you. I think it's happening as we speak, pretty much, right? As Chris, so for Kristen Choi, a young adult member of our church who is in San Francisco right now, singing the South Korean national anthem in um, remembrance of is it in remembrance of the um, ceasefire signed in the Korean conflict or. celebration of the liberation of South Korea and we give thanks that we that Kristen is willing to share her talent her gifts on this day of remembrance in that community and we give thanks for all of those who fight and advocate for freedom for all people and pray for a day of peace around the world where we can set down our weapons and allow people to live, all people to live freely and in a just society. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Any others? Uh, yes, Pastor George. I have a prayer of joy and gratitude that our United Methodist connection lets us be in ministry to and with people across oceans and across ethnic and national and even enemy lines. Yes. Just this week, Louise and I got in contact with Natasha. Natasha, when we knew her last in 2006, was a teenager on a work team with our volunteer and mission work team in her hometown in Russia. Mm. We worked together, we ate together, we prayed, we played together. And she was a shining, she got to our hearts in many ways. We've often wondered what happened to Natasha mm -hmm. and all those other kids. Now, 17 years later, we learn and have been in touch with her electronically. She and her husband got green cards finally. Mm -hmm. Now permanent resident status can be employed in the US and has a 10 month old baby girl. Uh -huh. And she sends her greetings across all of the cultural gap. And I'm yes. grateful that our church lets us share in that connection. Yes, we give thanks for your relationship with Natasha, a relationship that was founded on this beautiful, connectional, worldwide church that brings um, people together who might otherwise never have met, never have known each other. And we give thanks that Natasha and her family have gotten their green cards and can be here in the United States with us. And we 
also just lift up a prayer for all of our connectional body who are across the world and especially those who are in areas of conflict and areas of war. May they know they are not alone, that they are in our prayers and that through our mission efforts, through UMVIM and the United Methodist Committee on Relief, that we are working to repair as much of this broken world as we can in Jesus' name. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Lynn. Uh, prayer of joy for Chloe Styles. Yes. Styles. Yep. <laughs> I love a motivational prayer. We give thanks for Chloe's gift of music, for her sharing her voice and talent with us today. And we pray that it may be a continuing thing, that we may hear from her and other young people and other gifted voices in our church as we truly have such an abundance of talent in our midst. Thank you, God. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Dennis. Absolutely. Prayers for that discernment in that mix as we, as we think about those who have been intolerant and in, in turn, it can, it can churn up intolerance of us for that intolerance. And, and God, we know that there were times where Jesus had righteous anger, where the tables were turned. And yet we also know that there's a lot of gray, there's a lot of nuance and that every single person, even those who are out of alignment of love, they are, they are your people as much as anybody else, as much as we are your people. So in all of this messiness, in all of this figuring out how to advocate and how to love, may we do so with care. May your spirit equip us to approach this work without judgment, but instead with hope, with hope that a new day can reign, a day where earth looks more like heaven. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Melissa. Yes, prayers for someone you know who is struggling with mental illness, which is creating lots and lots of issues and difficulties in their life and in their relationships. Prayers that the help that they need can be found, can be accepted, can take effect. And we pray for the state of mental health care in our country that we might all take seriously the importance of caring for our own mental health and for caring for those who are struggling. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. This time I'm going to invite us to take a moment of silent prayer. God, we have arrived in this place from many different paths. Some of us come here full of joy and excitement and hope. Some of us have arrived here with worry, sadness, heaviness on our heart and shoulders. And many of us have arrived here with a mix of emotions. In all of it, may we remember that you are with us that you will never leave us nor forsake us. May we remember the promise that where two or more are gathered, your spirit dwells among us. So help us, help us to stay connected to one another, 
through it is in our connection to one another and to the church that we can even more clearly see your spirit with us. For those who are hurting, for those who are sick, for those who are mourning, God, care for them, comfort them, strengthen them, and allow us to know the ways which we can be part of that work, where we can be a partial answer to those prayers. For those who have shared their talent, are sharing their talent, for those who have had a week of service and caring for the community in Del Nord County, for our young people, for our annual conference, for all of the places we see new life emerging. Thank you, God. Thank you. May we not take this new life and this new thing for granted. Instead, may we step in and and be gardeners, tenders of the garden that you have started. These things that you have sprouted up, may we be in partnership with you. May we provide the, the water. May we provide the pruning. May we be present in the garden with you to see what arises from the soil. And God, now we join together in the prayer your Son taught us, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In recognition that every single person is a reflection of our Creator, I now invite you to stand as you are able and greet those around you in peace. Ha <laughs> ha.